Now then, listener, I want to let you know that my book, What a Flanker, is available now in paperback. It's had some great feedback. Rugby World said, what a flanker, what a book. The Telegraph described it as explosive. The Sun said, not for the faint of heart. If you haven't got a copy now, order yours in paperback. Or get it in ebook or audiobook read by me. Thanks for your support. Now on with the show. Hi everyone, I'm Jace Haskell and you're listening to What A Flanker, the podcast. Now my guest today was my former strength and conditioning coach during my time at WAS. He's also coached Wales, Ireland, the British and Irish Lions and in my mind responsible for changing the face of strength and conditioning across the game of rugby around the world. He was also the master behind Uruguay's win in, against Fiji in the World Cup. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Craig White. Ask. Nice to see you, mate, after so many years. Mate, I put that down. I reckon it's been over eight years since I've seen you. Yeah, probably, mate. Probably. And things have changed for you and for me. Yes. But way more for you than anything else. It's been really exciting, mate. It's been an adventure. How are you during this period, though? Good? Been productive? Found it stressful? Um, generally, OK. I mean, I'm grateful that I can still coach online, but I'm ungrateful that I'm just spending too much time on a laptop because I'm, I like to be around people. But generally, OK. Like, be, you, do you feel like you've, you've maximised that kind of... You know, did you feel pressure to be productive? Because I know so many people we talk to have either seen it as an opportunity to kind of com complain about stuff and have gone through hardships. And, and I think context is really important. All the guests I've, ha I've had on have spoken about the importance of context. Your experience of COVID is different from mine mm, and everyone else. Of course. But did you feel pressure to be to do stuff or have you actually put your feet up occasionally as well and found a bit more relaxation? A bit of both, really. Um, I mean, I've learned over the years to kind of to flip it into a positive and an opportunity. I've kind of learned how to do that. So. Um, I've, I have been busy, but I've just been busy kind of developing programs and developing different ways of coaching people. So for those of you who don't know exactly who you are, and I know that introduction talking obviously all about the, the fact you've changed the face of rugby, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about where you started and kind of what you've done in your own sort of words? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm from Wigan. I'm a, I'm a northerner, I'm a pie eater, and um, I grew up with rugby league. I always thought I was, I was going to be a rugby league professional. Didn't happen. Um, and I ended up going into the world of conditioning. And, um, you know, I was very lucky even during my degree at John Moores to work with um, Phil Clark and Andy Clark, who were kind of uh, associated with, with rugby. Phil was a player at Wigan and Andy's now an agent. And um, Andy used to be a conditioning coach. So I was lucky during the whole three the years of my degree to go with Andy to Ireland. He was a conditioner for Ireland to sail. Halifax Rugby League to train some Wigan players. And, and when I came out of uni, I was ready to go. So I was a conditioner at Waterloo. I was a conditioner at uh, Ireland. I worked for Wales. I worked for London Wasps. I worked for Bolton Wanderers. I um, went on a couple of Lions tours. I worked for Leicester Tigers. And um, yeah, I, it was it was just a, an incredible, when I say it, I mean, when I used to work full time in, in sport, in, in rugby, and mostly rugby, but a little bit football as well. It was it was an incredible journey that kind of evolved from fitness and I kind of exhausted that because I was a workaholic and I just, I was a learning fanatic and into nutrition, into holistic nutrition, into mind, body, um, multiple levels of nutrition. I became fascinated with the mind and NLP and human behavior and leadership and culture and team building and soft skills so it's just been rugby's been kind to me it's been a doorway where i could just really evolve on on many many levels of ultimately improving performance because the reason i wanted to get you on is for those people who have read my book what a flanker i talk a lot about yourself in the book um i've talked about you on the, the good the bad and the rugby because I, i'm fascinated um a about your journey because of all the, the you sort of you describe yourself as having a midlife transformation but I want to come on to a little bit more about that before. But yeah. what, you, what I talked about in the book was your... I was very lucky in the early days of WASP to come into probably, I, mean, I don't know if you agree, one of the most professional environments that was going at the time. And also, I think, since. You know, I, I came straight out of school off the conveyor belt of, of um, sort of academy players straight into an environment. Do you look back at those days with WASP and see what you put together with Warren... Um, and understand the impact you had on the game. Um, yeah, I do actually, and um, because at the time, Hask, we did, we just did something that was very, very different, you know. And, and uh, 
to keep things simple, we I kind of had a look at the environment and what was going on around, and um, the players were falling through a net. You know, there was no standards, and there was one conditioning coach for a squad of 30 players. And I mean, all we did really was we credit to Warren for kind of um, making it happen. We in the space of six weeks, um, we went from having like a conditioning coach to having four conditioning coaches and three interns, which creates a net where on one hand the players value because they feel like somebody cares about them and on the other one there's no place to hide. So the standards that we set were really a result of, of providing a net that the players couldn't fall through and just simplifying the programme and coming away from the, the, the mindless running games that used to happen and just kind of focusing more on the individual and, and the contact conditioning part of the game as well. Because during those those days, backs and forwards used to do the same stuff all the time. You know, there was kind of uh, you know a real difference in what was what was being done, um, but not in a good way, not in like an individual way. It was kind of well, the backs have to do this, forwards have to do this, and there was kind of no there was no periodized the training. Mm. Um, there was nutrition. There's no supplementation. I mean, what would you say that what, what were the kind of things that you really felt that you brought in that was very different to what was being done out there before? Um, Individualisation, for one, of course, um, positional specific it really wasn't done at the time. It's obviously done now. Yeah. Um, probably. Looking back, probably the biggest impact was having a team of staff that really, really cared about the players and really gave a fuck about the players. Yeah. And a team of staff who had a responsibility to really hold the space for a player when he walked in the door in the morning, because a player would walk in the door in the morning with a shitload more problems than we had. So it was our responsibility to really be there and be an energizer and hold them and, and ask questions. We used to run a scheme called Player Watch. We didn't have monitoring and the Player Watch was right. You've got those six players, you've got those six, you've got those six, you've got those six, you've got those six. When they come in, you ask them these six questions. You know what I mean? How they are, how they slept, you know, how's it going at home, everything okay, anything you need, and so on. And it, we, we, just, we just cared about the players. Talking about Player Watch, um, a mutual friend of ours and actually someone you got in, brought into this game was, is Paul Stridgen. He's obviously talked about in the book as the rope. Everybody knows it with the healing rope. Uh, <laughs> I mean, first of all, you said that people come into the door with, with less problems than, than, than the staff. I disagree with Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> that guy is yeah. a hero of a man. Yeah. He's got some problems. Um, but when you talk about Player Watch, I mean, you actually put... Um, Bobby with uh, Trevor Leota once. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. tell people about that story? Because it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, Trevor was an enigma, wasn't he? Yeah. And um, we all loved Trevor, but sometimes he went missing. And um, we'd had an incredible season one year. We were going for the double or the triple. And um, we'd got to the, the final. And, you know, we heard a few rumours that Trevor was um, in red... In What was it called? The red, red back? back. The red yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His local kind of haunt where he drank rum and cokes all night. Yeah, and, Jack, um, but it was like 90% Jack Daniels in a, <laughs> in, in, in a pint glass with just a, with a little sprinkle of coke. It's impressive. I, I had a sip of his drink once. He went, bro, have this. I, I was drunk of one sip, mate. Uh, it was uh -huh. professional. So, yeah, and, um, and we heard these rumours. It was like a month before the Heineken Cup final. We thought, fuck, you know, Trevor's one of our main players. Yeah. And, and, and if you remember, like, him and Phil Greening... And the impact they both had on and off. Phil, Trevor would play for 60 minutes and Phyllis would come on, or sometimes it was vice versa. And um, um, we just got Bobby to, to live with him because Bobby had an incredible connection with him. It, it was a really loving connection. They trusted each other. And Bobby tells stories about actually going to the red back with Trevor, but not allowing him to drink. <laughs> yeah. you know? And we won the Heineken final. And I believe that if that didn't happen and Trevor went off the rails, we might not have won the Heineken Cause, final. Because also, um, you know, Trevor had a penchant for, for KFC. Bobby having to like... Because the thing with Bobby is, he's such a good guy. And like, he's, you know, we were talking off air about the importance of heart. He has such a big heart and he, and he genuinely cares. But I can... But he also doesn't take any shit. Mm. And he's like, meh. Mate, Trevor, are you fucking serious? Like trying to get a KFC, him yeah. like having to steer him away and stop him. Because on his day, Trevor was the best, the best, well, I reckon one of the best hookers in the world. Mm. 
but he was he had a lot of temptation in his life. So Bobby was yeah. really kind of there to stop him doing anything. I mean, he? I wouldn't have sent anybody, but Bobby was primed for it. And that's why Bobby's gone on to be a great condi conditioning coach. Yeah. Because there's so many conditioning coaches in the world. And I often get asked the question, how can I improve? And one of the, the ways to improve is to set standards and just love players and show them that you love them, but also don't fucking let them get away with anything. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And that's, that's the difference between a great coach and, and, and an average coach. But I think that's a good lesson in life. I think, you know, people talk about discipline with their children, discipline with their animals, discipline with themselves. Without discipline, we, we stray. You know, people talk about this intuitive eating thing. Just eat what your body tells you to do. Mm. My fucking body tells me to eat donuts and smoke cigars and, and, and drink whiskey all yeah, the time. That's yeah. all it says to me yeah. is eat pizza. So yeah. I have to ignore every, of my, every one of my natural instincts. And I think that's very much the same with, with coaches. You know, you need to kind of have that, that discipline, but the players need to be held by standards. Otherwise, yeah. without standards, how do you know what's good and what's not? Yeah. And ultimately, it's about a great... If someone perceives you as a great coach, ultimately it's about trust. And again, for me, if someone really trusts you, they trust you because they know that you care about them, but they know that you won't you won't let them get away with stuff. It's that combination. If there's too much love and care, it's like, mate, I need to work hard. If there's too much, you gotta do that, it's Groundhog Day, they get pissed off because there's no love. So it has to be a balance. When we talk to Warren, and I'm not sure which order the podcasts are gonna, gonna come out in, but. When we talked to Warren, I asked him about what were his influences because I saw you guys very much as a, as, a, as, a, as a team. I think it's fair to say that a conditioning coach is only allowed to to flourish if the head coach allows that that remit. Mm. Because you know, the, I find a lot of type people in rugby and in sport in general they tick the boxes. We need a good trainer. We need a training team. We need a um, psychologist but they can't let any of that go. They can't empower you, they can't empower the psychologist. So even while they've got all the boxes ticked, mm. none of them are able to have the impact. Mm. The one thing it seemed like with you and Warren was, he, he let you put what you wanted to put into place. And when I asked him who his influences were, he said three coaches. And he said the first one was a guy that um, kept training times to a short period. Mm. Next guy was someone that really focused on kind of, um, mental toughness, so putting guys through tough sessions. And then the third guy sort of was um, about enjoying stuff off the field and the importance of bonding. Those are quite clear messages through his training. Yeah. Was it refreshing? Did you sort of almost take the job and say, listen, let me, I'm a peacock, let me fly, or, or I mean, how did that dynamic work between you two? Well, I'd initially first met Warren in Ireland. I was going to support Connacht um, and some of the provinces in my, in my role. And um, even before I went full time with Ireland, and um, he was just kind of learning his ropes really, and I was learning my ropes, and he was at Connacht, and um, and we just bonded together. I think he loved my my energy and my affection, my uh, passion for learning, and um, so we all already had that bond. And and I ended up a few years later working for Bolton Wanderers in the Premiership, and Warren was in Wasps, and because of that bond, he, he brought me to Wasps. Um, but it's definitely a reason for me teaming up with Warren and, and on and off working with him for like nine, ten years because. Um, uh, on one level, I am a fucking control freak and I want to control things, you know, I want to lead from the front and, and run uh, my programme and, and be able to do that and be able to make mistakes and Warren allowed me to do that and to Warren's credit, he allows all his staff to do that, to be honest. Do you, I mean, I remember sessions where you would be on the sideline and you'd be shouting at Warren, going, Warren, you've, you said, we said 45 minutes and he, and he would be bargaining with you and saying, right, okay, listen, We'll take two minutes off scrums at the end to have that. Mm. That was that was so unique because in rugby, uh, as in a lot of sports, people think more is better. Yeah, we've been out there. So I've been with teams now. We've been out there hour and a half, hour and forty minutes. Even with England pre, kind of pre Eddie Jones and, and and pre Stuart Lancaster, we'd be out there for two hours. And what they would do is the coaches wouldn't count the scrums at the end, the lineouts at the end, and the warm up. Yeah. That's fucking two and a half hours, but you were sort of meticulous. Where, where did that come from? And did you enjoy that kind of control? I did actually. There's two things, two things that are coming to me now, Hask, as you mentioned that. The first thing to say is that behind all that is permission. So Gats would have said to me, Whitey, one of the things I love about you is that, keep doing it. And if I didn't do it, you know what I mean? He'd have a go at me. So I had permission to do it, which is a big thing. Empowered. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, you know what I mean? He gave me permission to do it. I mean, the other thing as well is because I didn't realise it at the time and, um, you know, I, I had quite a bit of anger inside of me. You know, I, I was I was angry, but that 
wasn't necessarily a negative. It just drove me, you know, I had this fire inside of me. I was like a little dog, you know, and um, yeah, I mean, I was okay. I've chilled out now as people say, I've become a bit more Zen, but yeah, I had that dog in me and I'm grateful to that dog. It drove me. It's interesting because w- w- when I read a, reading your website, because we haven't been in contact for a while and obviously I, we, you know, I always check in with people <coughs> and we've got mutual friends and ask what, you, what you're doing. And you said you're about being angry. I was trying to think back in terms of when I ever saw you angry and obviously uh, you know, to pass your time always makes things go fond, you know, fond of your memory. But I don't, I don't remember that. I, I don't remember because I wasn't, I was in and out of the first mm. team. I didn't ever necessarily see that. But all I remember it, it, with you and, and my relationship was you always put an arm around me. I don't know if you remember the first P- Poland trip. I talk about that in the, in the book where you were like, I was 17 going on fucking 30, you know, <laughs> and the, I remember we were doing the, the training and, and you left me out of the conditioning. You were like, mate, I want to, and I, I think I went up to someone and was like, oh, why am I not doing the coaching? And I, and I, you would, it turns out you were looking after me and trying to protect me. And then you were like, right, if you want to fucking go in the conditioning, you, you get in. I mean, um, do, do you look back at those memories? Do you, I mean, what do you, you know, what do you think about that kind of stuff? Um, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's, it's about understanding people. And I guess, obviously we'll come on to it later that what I'm doing now, but understanding people has been a huge fascination of mine. And, you know, what somebody's poison is another person's elixir, you know, and um, it's, I've just been fascinated with understanding the individual. And and back then it, it was also a gut feeling as well. So if I thought I was protecting someone by leaving them out, I'd, I'd leave them out. Yeah. Now, I wasn't a great communicator back then. Um, I'm a better communicator now, but yeah, I mean, I just wanted to treat people as individuals. Because I, I mean, from those early days, were there any real lessons that you feel like you um, you, you, you took from it? Like, was is commu- not communicating one of them, or what would you say? Um, well, all growth comes from perceived voids. Uh, that's something I've learned in recent times. And um, looking back, whilst I was driven, energetic, passionate. Um, I had a certain level of intellect and know-how. I was great at demonstrating and I was a good practical coach. I wasn't a great communicator and I sometimes used to get myself into trouble and there seemed to be a lot of conflict. And um, and I didn't realize it at the time within my professional full-time career, but um, I do realize the void now and I actually realize now that the void of not being a great communicator as moved me to becoming a much more rounded, proficient communicator. So without that void, there's no growth. You must be quite proud though, that so many people that you put in under your team have now gone on to become head, con- head conditioners. Because in my opening kind of remarks, I said about <coughs> the legacy you've left in, in rugby, you know, because like you said, the periodized training, the, you know, the maintaining standards the you know kind of individualized training was was so unique i don't think because people see everyone on tv now big fit and powerful Mm. our sole objective was to be big fit and powerful Mm. if you remember um you know all the runways we used to do all that kind of stuff but but within that group of of people you kind of laid down your doctrine and and like maybe if you didn't feel like you communicated but all of those people have have gone out Do do you do you see the kind of coaches you've shaped even when you weren't necessarily at your very best. Uh, yeah, and I'm proud of that as well. Yeah, it's great. Um, I, I mean, I like to give people opportunities. Even in my work today, I, you know, I, I give people opportunities. It's just, I, I buzz off doing that. Plus, we had so many more staff compared to the others, so, <laughs> yeah. so it's a numbers game as yeah. well. But, but I just think it's astounding when I, when I think of all the guys that, you know, um, that you see, you know, Mark Bick and Paul Stridgen, um, um, you know, all, the, all these kinds of guys that have gone all around the country. Even um, Al, do you remember Al. you had, yeah, Al, your sort of apprentice. Yeah, you were to lose. Yeah, you were like, um, you were a bit like the emperor and he was Darth Vader <laughs> um, and he would just follow you around. I, I can never remember, but he's gone on to Leicester for, for ages. Mm. Do you still speak to those guys and, and, and now you feel more rounded? Do you go back and try to uh, polish a few sharp edges you might have left? I, I, I do have a contact with them, yeah. Yeah, not a lot, and especially during the period in my life where I kind of went off the radar a little bit. But but now, yeah, now more than ever, I feel kind of reconnecting with those guys for various reasons. Obviously, you left the, 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 the rugby world afterwards, which we're going to come on to next. But there was a period of time when you were working with the Lions 2005, Clive Woodward. 
and working with, with Warren Gatland. And you obviously had a bit of a break into football, but Warren sort of lured you, lured you back. And you, we've talked about the affinity with him. What would you say, was those two different Lions tours a real good introduction to the way to do things and not to do things in your, in your mind? Um, good question. Initially, I'm, I mean, looking back, I don't think one was right and one was wrong. Okay. Um, I respect Clive for trying to do what he did because, oof, I mean, he tried everything he could do to win that series in New Zealand and, and a, a big factor in his decision to take so many people was fatigue. So I don't um, criticise Clive for that. He did, you know, he, he did something and his, I mean, I don't even know if he made a mistake, but if he did, his mistake has paved the way for others to do something different in the future. But he tried something different and um, I was privileged to be part of that, even though I didn't enjoy the experience. Um, but what happened for me on that Lions tour, and I can only speak from my own individual kind of experiences, you know, I just felt a disconnection. There's so many, many people. And, and if I'm working with a rugby team, I want to feel connection. I want to feel touch. I want to experience brotherhood. I mean, my brother went into the army when I was eight, so I didn't really grow up with a brother, and I always craved brotherhood. It's, it's, it's a big craving of mine. And I didn't get that on that tour. There was so many different uh, characters. It was, you know, you, I'd be with the first team, with the midweek team, and th there just wasn't a, a bond that was created. And I didn't enjoy that. And the person I really created a bond with was Shawzy. Me and Shawzy <laughs> went kind of off in our corner <laughs> morning and complaining. Um, and the, But the 2009, I mean, Geach just kind of went back to basics. He just yeah. said, right, and and uh, who, who better to have by his side but, but Gats? to go back and get the basics right. And um, it was just um, it was just a lot more relaxed. And there was only one team. There wasn't two teams competing with each other, just one nucleus, if you like. And um, it, it was a good laugh as well. What, what, is that why you didn't enjoy it? Because of that, that separation or the other reasons? Yeah, you didn't... no, I didn't enjoy it because of the separation, because of the lack of real, authentic, deep human connections. That, but that's something I talked about, the difference between... Mm -hmm. And I think you've, you've articulated it really nicely. I mean, I talked about um, people being too task-focused, not people-focused. Mm. So it's, I, I prefer and believe you, can have, you need to have a plan. You need to have a hierarchy of leadership. Everyone needs to be on the same page. But then the, the, to make it work, it's the connection of the people. If yeah. you don't have that, yeah. you fall apart. And actually, you fall apart way quicker because there's, there's a veneer of connection. And mm -hmm. as soon as pressure comes on, people start losing. Everyone just looks after number one. Yeah. And, and like you said, you have no brotherhood. Was that sort of quite similar? Because I talked about Stuart Lancaster's regime where you know he's fantastically hardworking. Again, like I uh, imagine Clive was, was on, on that tour, but didn't necessarily create the connections or have the characters to create connections. Because a lot of coaches fear characters, but with characters comes warmth, comes humor, becomes mm -hmm. whatever else. It seemed like that in that 2005 tour, that that was, that was difficult. W were, you, were you empowered as well, as much as you were under Warren, or, or were, you, were you able to be, to be no, free? No, I wasn't to empowered to be, uh, because um, on the 2005 tour, I was actually um, one of two conditioners. I, I'd been invited on that tour from Dave Redding. So, oh, right. So, so, so it's not like, I, so I wasn't in charge. Right, okay. Yeah. And that must have been even more frustrating for some from going to that and then and seeing where people are going wrong or things you'd want to change and not being able to do it because you hadn't been given the permission you had from exactly. Warren. Exactly, exactly. So, so yeah, thanks for undercovering that. That was part of the frustration as well. Yeah, no, because that's, that's I, mean, I just think it's fascinating to, also, I think people forget as well with the conditioning stuff is, is what a lot of people in real, the real world don't have when they go to train in the gym or when they, or the people who don't train at all, is that once you put your body through a bit of hardship, you have the endorphins, you feel like you fulfill the task. Mm -hmm. When you do that with people, that's how you form a team. If you have to suffer together as, mm -hmm. as, as a team, and a conditioner is in charge of that mm -hmm. because you have to be all, all and everything. You have to motivate yeah. when people don't want to. Yeah. You have to be tough when they don't want to. And if you're not empowered, I can imagine that makes your life 10 times more difficult. And actually, if you don't have a bond with your players, not, you don't need to be friends with them. Mm. They need to have it clear, but that can make things even worse, I would yeah. have thought. Yeah, of course, of course. Because that's, yeah, I mean, I, I then 2009, very different. You're then back in charge, felt more empowered, yeah. and you were able to put the stuff in place. I mean, was it very similar again, individual training? Um... It was very similar. I mean, there was a detailed plan, but once the detailed plan is in place, it enables a sense of relaxation and fun and bonding, and, and you know, you can focus more on the people. But um, 
yeah it was just a, it was just a, it was just fun you know it was good fun it's interesting you said about the enjoyment thing between between both i think that always gets put down to so let's get pushed aside the side for, for the attention to detail, which is great. But actually enjoying what you yeah, do is, is, yeah. is essential. And Gats is also good at that as well. Yeah. I mean, how do you marry that up as a conditioner? Because um, I think some conditioners are, and guys can often be fearful of letting players let their hair down and have a beer and, and everything else. But you sort of see the importance of that as well as the hard training. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's the carrot and the stick. And it's communication. If you remember at Wasps, it's diff more difficult to do these days, but if you remember at Wasps, we'd actually give you the, the season plan. Um, and even when I worked at Leicester Tigers, we'd give them the season plan, we'd have it up and, and we'd regularly meet with the guys and say, right guys, do you realize, I know it's fucking tough now, but do you realize in two weeks, there's three days off there, you can actually let your hair down there, you know, keep at it. It's just communication, Hask. Do you think that's possible, though, to put a season plan together? Because I reckon that was the only... I mean, bizarrely, Wasps went away. No other club did it. When I came back to Wasps for six years, we got two weeks in advance only. That's all we ever got. And then, and then when I went to Northampton, they gave a season plan. Yeah. Do you think it should be easy to be able to plan that detail in with, with some wiggle room either side? Um, it's, it's sometimes not easy because of the fixture list. Sometimes you don't know what games you're going to play, so that's a little bit difficult. Um, but I have come across a lot of coaches, especially in my time working for World Rugby over the last 12 years, that, that don't give the players information. You know, it's like the player comes in on a Monday and it's like there's a schedule for the week, but he doesn't know what's happening the week after. And um, part of that's a lack of planning and a lack of detail, but there's also a level of, of control as well. Like, don't fucking tell them. So, um, I mean, I'm the opposite. I mean, for me, you give the players as much information as you can so they can sort their life out. They can sort the hard days and the easy days out. They can book a holiday six weeks in advance. They communicate with the wife, which makes easy, happy wife, happy life. And, and then you can smash them, you know? Exactly. In terms yeah. of get the best out of them in the, way, in the way you train them. What would you say is kind of the biggest errors you see made at the moment in, in let's talk, because my audience is predominantly rugby, in, in kind of that rugby coaching conditioning area? Because without putting words in your mouth, my, my, the biggest thing I, I fear is that people have done stuff because they've always done it. And there's no kind of thought around, are we doing the right stuff? For me, it comes back to things that we've already touched on around people. There's so much, I mean, technology is amazing and it's, it is to an extent changing the face of sport, but it's so, it's so dominant. Um, as men, we're already kind of left brain dominant anyway, and it's just forcing us up more into that linear thinking, system process, you know, logical sequencing methodologies. And um, whilst it's great and it's changing the game, it's also at the expense of the people skills. So for me, there's a lack of people skills. There's a lack of uh, the soft skills in the whole of professional sport, to be honest. And it's something that I, I'm trying to change in terms of my life purpose, if you will. It's, it's, it's a niche that I want to move in and help people with. Now, I don't know whether you'll, you'll validate this argument, but I, I've talked about it a lot on, on The Good, The Bad, The Rugby, and in, in, and in the book, What a Flanker, that rugby has a perception of being, or sport in general has a perception of being super professional. I, I just don't think it is because of those lack of those, mm -hmm. those soft skills. Like, if you can reflect back on, we're monitoring your conditioning, we're monitoring this, but yet our interactions, the way players are treated around con contracts, the way staff are treated, I mean, it's, I think it's pretty amateur still. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, I do think it's pretty amateur. Um, I think maybe the sport that leads the way in terms of, I guess, the balance between the, just the kind of technology and the science and the, the method methodology and, if you like, the, the human side is, is potentially AFL, you know, um, I know Richmond and the AFL have, have done a lot around uh, people skills and communicating in circles and opening up and speaking about feelings and, the, and they had a pretty successful run off the back of that initiative. So um, I think we could look to AFL. I, I, in fact, in my experience, and I'm not so much involved in SNC like I used to be, I don't follow all the, the trends as much as I used to, but I, do, I, I would say that AFL is leading the way in terms of professional support for um, for players I mean I would say from an outside perspective because I'm not in it now but I, I talk to certain players and the one thing that's level against rugby now is everyone's the same size everyone's as powerful 
Thanks, Craig, for that. I mean, I, I didn't want to bl- all the purists who watch this. If you want to blame anyone, yeah. it's basically Craig White's <laughs> fault that they were all they're all in mental shape. But everyone looks the same. So if we've almost peaked and you're making one or two percent in nutrition or hydration or, or uh, rest, I truly believe that the one thing we're not exploring is is the mind. Does it does it astound you how little time is taken around the psychological elements of the game? Yeah, it does. Um, but it's coming. You know, it's definitely coming because it has to, because there's a void there and, you know, the whole thing around mental health and concussion and um, players not opening up. It, there's a void that needs to be filled now. Um, but it does astound me, yeah. Um, I mean, like you say, we're just kind of... We're like hamsters on a wheel and we, cause if the All Blacks are doing something or if, if that Tucker Club's doing something, that we, we kind of we, we get, grab hold of it and we, we think it works. It's like best practice. Um, and we, we audit and we kind of have a checklist and, um, but yeah, but the whole, I mean, there's the human mind and human potential is limitless, but yeah, we, we're just scratching the surface. But I feel like we, I feel like we put limits on it because we don't, it's such a good point. Say the All Blacks are doing something or someone's written an autobiography or someone <laughs> has, a, has had a load of success. They take what they've <coughs> learned from that and they try to enforce it on their players without actually looking their players in the eye and go, does it suit this group of players? Yeah. Is it is it right? I mean, it's interesting that you that you see that because I think um, I think it's definitely a, a massive issue that we're just sort of you know you hear about a trend. I remember the GPS vest, the heart rate monitors. Well, they've got him, so we've got to get him. Mm, um, you know, we. I mean, I remember at one club. The only time we ever used GPS d- data was to beat the players with, to say, mm-hmm. you haven't done this, you haven't done that, until I pointed out that half the team weren't wearing them yeah. and that bloke, the, the conditioner just joined the dots on a graph. Yeah. And it was amazing because we all got thrown out of the meeting and this conditioner went in, got fucking bollocks and just came with like one solitary tear down his eye. But, th- you know, is it amazing that we're still, we're still doing that kind of stuff and just trying to shoehorn what we believe to be right onto people? It is, yeah. There's something I want to bring up here yeah. as well, which is quite important about this, about... Yeah. A previous question that you said in terms of the why are we not going deeper into that psychological human kind of development side and um maybe this is a bit controversial but hopefully it'll also kind of strike a chord with some coaches out there is i believe if you've not gone into yourself if you've not explored your own shit and uncovered your own fucking gold that's been suppressed and repressed and hidden away and you've gone on that journey and you've cultivated more present moment awareness and flow, and you've worked on projecting value-driven visions, coming back and understanding where your blocks are and putting an action plan together, you ain't gonna fucking sell it to your players because you haven't experienced it. So again, it's part of my journey in life now and the way I serve, I wanna help coaches to do that. I wanna help coaches to really kind of feel safe enough to cultivate a deep, deep sense of self-understanding, cultivate more capacity to keep coming back to, to become centered and, and project a really meaningful vision in life. That's fascinating because we, I talked to, to Paul Moore and, and the stuff I firmly believe that that only you can fix you. I think people don't have the answers, so we, we go to psychologists and everything else to give you tools, to give you understanding, but you only you fix you. And more often than not, People who aren't prepared to fix themselves point at other people and point out their errors without having to ever explore it. It's, you know, it's the old analogy. I've got two gardens. I'm looking over at your garden going, fucking hell, why? Look at the state of that. And mine's got burnt out cars in it. Half of it's on fire and there's dead people in it. And but yeah, I'm obsessed with that. And I think you're exactly right. It is difficult though, because it, in, when it, it takes on a whole new dimension as a coach because um, you are having to, to, to develop others. But I think you're exactly right. How many people sit down and understand, you know, how they learn, how they want to be talked to, what do they actually feel, what are their goals? Um, and I think, it, I mean, do you reckon that would be the biggest piece of advice if someone who's going into coaching is actually <laughs> coach yourself first, get your shit in order, instead of trying to get your your badges and your, you know, and understand how a you know, set up a breakdown or wherever it might be, work on the, on those key things. Hundred percent, mate. Hundred million percent. And the whole idea of player welfare coach welfare should be aimed at that yeah there's a whole piece of coach education pathway that's missing as well it's 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 all this you say you had kind of instead of a midlife crisis a midlife transformation talk to me about what what the hell happened because i still don't know i think it was 2009 
I'm working for the Welsh rugby team, physical performance manager. Um, great setup, good car, good salary, good home. Um, thought I'd be there for a number of, a long time. Actually, I was settled with my ex-wife Marta at the time, and um, so she said she begged me to go on this yoga retreat. Fucking, she begged me, and I was like into my gym then. I was like sometimes training twice a day in the gym, and um, but I kind of had an open mind, and and I, and I agreed to it. And I had a perception of what kind of yoga was. Yeah, so do I. That, when, I when I read about it, when I read about it, of all the people, I, I couldn't imagine you being forced to go to a yoga retreat like me. My wife went to go to a yoga retreat. I'd be like, "Fuck off!" But I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm desperate to hear. Sorry to interrupt you. What, what it was like? So, so I went, and it was in Thailand. It was a month retreat. I thought, "Oh, retreat? Yeah, I'll have a bit of that." Anyway, it was full on. It was like first day. You know, there's a guy with a big a swami, a big orange fucking dress on, and I'm thinking, "What the fuck have I come here?" And um, cut a long story short, you know, we'd be in there at seven o'clock in the morning trying to meditate. And then you'd have two yoga classes a day. And then in the evening time would be a lecture on the philosophy, the science, the methodology of yoga. So anyway, um, initially my kind of quest to learn, I, I was fascinated. I was absolutely fascinated with these lectures. I mean, I couldn't stretch and I was getting tight and stuff like that, but I was fascinated. Um, and, and that kept me going because I, I was taking notes every night and was fascinated about, about yoga and the levels of life and connection between, you know, the microcosm and the macrocosm. It was like fucking blew my mind. Um, but what happened in the kind of physical practice of it was I realised that I'd never, ever been still in my life, ever. And I was forced to be still. I was forced to stay in a posture. I was forced to breathe. I was forced to be silent and try and focus on my heart and I couldn't keep still. And I got a little bit better and I got a little bit deeper. And as I started to get deeper into the practice um, and took time out and learned to be with the silence, I just realized that, oh my God, there's so much I've suppressed. It's like I've suppressed all this soft stuff, all this love, all this kindness, all this gentleness, all this, if you like, feminine side of me. And I've also suppressed a lot of stuff that I didn't want, I also didn't want the world to see that was a little bit darker, like shame, the fact that I was bullied as a kid, um, you, know, you know, shame around my sexuality, suppressed anger that sometimes popped up and it was like, fuck me, I'm presenting this guy to the world, but really, there's so much more, it's like, whew, there's incredible potential in this, but there's also a lot of fear. So anyway, I went back into the Welsh rugby team, like four weeks later, like, what the fuck? What's happened? Like, what the fuck am I doing? Teaching people to carry a leather ball and put it over a fucking try line and what the fuck are you talking about? What the talk about are you talking about? Now, I wasn't owning my shit then because I was projecting it out. I was saying, well, rugby's a fucking shit. Rugby's egoic. He's a prick. He's a prick. <laughs> he's fucking arrogant. And he's arrogant. Um, and I'd go home at night and I'd cry. And I didn't know why I was crying. It was like, oh my God. I didn't know, but I know now there was a, there was a recalibration taking place. There was a re-identification taking place. There was transformation, but I thought it was a crisis. So I knew I had to get out of the job but I didn't have the balls to leave a 130 grand job a year. Until a year later when it was like, enough's enough, Gats, Gats, I'm gone. Six months before the World Cup, I'm gone, Gats. I'm gonna live in Thailand with my, with my uh, wife, Marta. So, um, so I left and uh, we went to live in Thailand. Now, we stayed in Thailand for about six months, deepening our journey of, of yoga and, and meditation and, and, and yeah, and, and um, and we did fasting retreats, we did detox retreats, a lot of different things to find out a little bit more about ourselves. And, um, and then luckily, because it was a blessing, I got some work with World Rugby, which it, I didn't really like it at the time because I was going through a phase of rugby shit or rugby's that and rugby's that. Um, but what it enabled me to do is to kind of jump in, travel to a country for two weeks, do some consultancy, get a bunch of money and then develop myself. So. 
I mean, even until this day, but definitely over an intense five year period, I just traveled the whole world to kind of know more about myself, but also to learn a new skill set that I could eventually bring back. Um, I became a yoga teacher two times. I became a meditation teacher. I became an NLP, NLP master practitioner. I sat in complete darkness for 10 days on my own. I drank water for 21 days. I saw a therapist, I saw, I saw a coach. I went on a men's retreat. Um, yeah, I hiked in the wilderness. I did so, so many things. I worked with coaches. I worked with a sexuality coach. I worked with a business coach. I worked with a coach that helped me with um, confidence. I just did so many things to kind of learn more about myself, but also bring something more meaningful into the way I served because I, I loved coaching and I, and I really wanted to coach. And, um, and some of it was painful, you know? I took, I, I drank ayahuasca. Oh, wow. I took mushrooms. You know, I just, I was just, I just, I was just desperate to kind of open Pandora's box and see what was inside. And, um, and, it, and sometimes it was tough. I went through a period of believing I was spiritual, you know, and I'd, it, it was extreme for a while, Hask. I, I even went through a period where I deleted all the music on my phone that I thought wasn't spiritual. I deleted friends on Facebook that I thought weren't as spiritual as me. And it was fucking my ego, really. And I'd do things that I thought, well, that's spiritual, that's spiritual. I'll do that and I won't do that and I won't do that. There was a split inside of me. But my journey over the past four, three or four years has, has been an integration of that. And now it doesn't matter if I'm fucking got my beads around my neck saying prayers or if I'm doing a podcast with you or, you know, helping a guy overcome confidence issues, it's all fucking spiritual. It's all, it's all help. You know, it's all a doorway to help each other on this planet that we live in. Thank God you said, you, you said okay to me because I'm definitely not <coughs> spiritual. Like I'm probably like the anti-spiritual person. Not, not I'm being tongue in cheek about it, but you Well, know. it depends how you define spirituality. Yeah, I know. I just think, you know. I define spirituality now as, as being kind yeah. and, and not knowing what it is, but somehow being connected to something that's driving me. I mean, that's my definition of spirituality. I mean, it's, it depends how you define it. Everything's conceptual until we perceive and define it. In your, in your early days with, with the yoga stuff, were <coughs> you speaking to your, your, your ex-wife about this? Were you speaking to anyone about it? Because when people go through a transformation, you, like you said, obviously you weren't cognitively understanding what, what was actually happening to you, but were you having any of those conversations? Only with my wife, nobody else, because there was too much fear. There was too much shame. Um, and... And again, and I had to go on that journey because I needed a healthy initiation. Because initiation, healthy initiation, is missing from today's society. But there's, there's something inside of us that's hardwired for it, so we seek it out. I remember going to a football, to a football match with all the hooligans. I, I, I didn't want to fight, but I was buzzing off the hooliganism because I needed some kind of initiation, which needed a bit of fear. We crave that. But we, we get into unhealthy initiation because there's no healthy initiation around anymore. And some of the work I do now provides a platform for healthy initiation. It's, I'm fascinated that you went through all these modalities and all these different things and, and then came out of it. But someone who appears to have had, I mean, I would never have said you were a damaged soul when I met you, but you never know what's behind people. I would, mm. I would, I would never have known. You obviously had stuff going on you know, I think there's always varying degrees of what people have going on. Some some people, for example, feel like they have to make a change with something really tragic has happened. But even someone that on the surface has everything going, you know, you went on such a journey. Do you, can you see why people sometimes get lost down a rabbit hole there? Because if you try so many different things, and I equate it to someone recommending a book or finding fasting, and then someone goes, oh, we don't really fasting, you want to be a vegan? Mm -hmm. And then goes, oh, well, I've got more benefits if you're just doing water fast. And it just goes round and round and round. And the, the next biggest thing, is the, the hottest thing. Yeah. Did, did you sort of, did you do too much on that or did you find that actually going through everything, you've now got a, uh, almost a, a great overview of everything? Well, the reference point to answer that question is from now, like this present moment now, and no, it was perfect. I mean, I might have got, I might have got lost at the time, Yeah. but no, it's perfect. What do you think out of all of those things had the most profound effect? The, the yoga, it sounds like to me, or? Initially yoga, but after that, um, going on a men's retreat and experiencing, I mean, you, me and you have experienced brotherhood within the rugby context. Yeah. 
but some of the retreats I've been on with men and the retreats that I facilitate now with men have brought me to a level of, of connection with a group of blokes that is so, so much deeper than anything I've ever experienced in rugby. In fact, I'd love to actually do it with a rugby team and I was supposed to be doing that kind of thing with a team recently and then COVID kicked in. Right. What what about them though? Is it's just because you feel like you're being so vulnerable, laid bare, you're actually communicating. I mean, I, I, how do you break down that barrier? I mean, even with yourself of going, fuck me, this is a bit, this is a bit odd because we're we're naturally hardwired to just be like a bit, yeah. especially our backgrounds in sport. We're the most skeptical, yeah. Yeah. negative people going. The answer to that is an easy one. The way to do it is not. It requires skill set, but the answer is simple: safety. You know, I believe that as humans, and we'll talk about men here as well, yeah. as men, when we feel safe, which took, could take a while, although in our retreat, we do it in one day, when we feel safe, it's like, oh, fucking hell, thank God for that. Boom, 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 boom. We start talking, we start interacting, we start having realizations, we release, we start to move our body a bit more, less restricted. It's It comes back to safety, Hask. Um, you know, we, we, we've been conditioned to perceive that the world's not a safe place. And um, if we feel incredibly safe, whether it's with a coach or with your missus or with a group of mates or going on a retreat, the magic happens. I've seen magic happen when, when men feel, feel really, really safe. Was the spiritualism the biggest rabbit hole you went down or was it things like the Iron Mask? A hundred percent, the whole spiritual thing. Um, there's a story actually of, I was told by a mentor of mine, a guy called Dr. John Diamartini. Oh, check him out. Paul Moore um, is working with yeah. him as well. Yeah, apparently he's unbelievable. I have to look yeah. into him. And John tells us a story of uh, a woman at one of his workshops saying, um, I'm really frustrated with my husband. Um, we've disconnected. The, the problem is I'm spiritual and he's not. And John said, okay, let's, let's, let's dig into this. What makes you think you're spiritual? And she said, well, I'm up at five in the morning. I'm gargling. Um, I have my green juice, I meditate, I breathe, I've got my beads on, I've got my crystals, I say my mantras, and um, me and the girls have little kind of get-togethers, and, um, and I've got an altar. Oh, okay, what about your husband? Um, or him, she says, uh, all he thinks about is his work. I said, oh, okay, um, what does he do? She, she, she told him what he did, I can't remember what it was. Right? How many people does he employ? 5,000. Does he care about his people? She said, care about them. He cares about them more than he, he cares about them more than me. Um, does he provide for them? He, he stresses himself out providing for them. Do they go to school? Are they, are they married? Yeah. Do they go to school, the kids? they have to pay for the fees? Um, and so on, anyway. Yeah. That, who's the most spiritual? You know? And hence what you said is that it's down to the interpretation. What is spirituality? It could be... It's down to interpretation. We're all could be spiritual in our own way. Oh, she might be the unkindest person on the planet, but she she says her prayers. What was it like? Um, I know we're going off to, to piece here, but I'm, I'm fascinated by all this because I, I genuinely mean this. You know, I obviously have a, a, a huge amount of affection for you. You know, uh, even from the days of in the wasp, where you teach me Olympic lifting. I never forget it. You were like Hasmet coming to the gym, teaching me how to like high pull, just that one on one. And obviously, you were the, the first team guru, and as, and as a younger player for you to take the time and attention to help me every kind of, every week, our own little 10 minute session, it, it, it meant a lot. Um, but I'm fascinated by this this this, this, this sort of self-development um, journey you went on. I mean, what, things like iron asker and stuff, what what did mm. that, what, what happened to you when you took that stuff? Because people, have, I've told people that have taken acid or iron asker and spoken to their dad who died, addressed all their problems and come out the other side. I've also heard people going completely fucking loopy. Of course, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I did it in what I believed was an authentic, um, environment, you know, I went to Peru, um, you know, with, with shamans and in a ceremonial space that was very kind of revered. And um, I've, I mean, I've done it a few times, not for a long time, but I've done it for a few times. Um, there's been a trend, I ask actually, with, with a lot of the, I guess, practices that I've done. And, the, uh, and looking back, the trend has often been, been actually around my relationship to women. So a lot, a lot of my reflections and my realizations were around fucking hell, mate. Nobody taught you how to relate to women, did they? You've not really fucking looked after them, have you? 
you've projected anger onto them, haven't you? So thankfully, now I believe I've got a, a more of an appreciation for the woman in me and I've got more appreciation for women in general. And, um, and I relate better to women as well. Uh, and so I'm really thankful for, for that and what it showed me. Um, I've never showed this before, but I will show it because I feel safe with you. <laughs> good, good, good. That's reassuring. I'll take that. Um, we took ayahuasca in Peru once. My, my ex-wife chose not to do it. Um, the first time freaked her out a little bit, so I kind of did the second one. And um, cut a long story short, for six hours, I experienced what it was like to be in her body having a female orgasm. Now that might sound fucking weird. I can already see my rugby mates thinking, <laughs> what the fuck's he going on about? <laughs> yeah. On my journey, man, yeah. looking back at that, it was like, oh my God. I don't know what just happened, but man, I've got so much respect for women now. Like, oh my God, I've got to fucking sort this shit out. I can't keep relating to a woman and going in and out relationships and every time she gets angry running off or every time you get angry, she runs off and I've got to look into this. So, so I mean, I've even been on a retreat with men in America where I was there for eight days and um, towards the end of it, the work that they did with me to help my nervous system to relearn was actually fucking screaming at me and getting angry with me. And, 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 and so I could learn to hold that without reacting. And it's helped because I used to get angry all the fucking time in relationships. And now I don't. Sounds like I might need to go on one of these retreats. I mean, I, I, no, I am fascinated no, I by this because, I, cause look, I see through some of the RPR stuff, we talked about the kinesiology and the breathing. And, and the, 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 the paths I've gone down with the psychology and how much more we can do. And I, and I always kind of, uh, yes, the, because of our skeptic background, because of our very masculine dominated background, you know, I went to boarding school from, from uh, you know, age 10 mm. to 18, all men, but the last few years of girls, but they didn't really pay much attention to me. Mm. And then a rugby team, all I have is male influences and you're not yeah. taught to, to ever, um, you know, understand women and understand relationships. And if the divorce rate is 50%, mm. I said this to someone, and 40% are probably unhappy, 10% have probably got there by mistake or have some form of, of, of maybe, um, you know, accidental understanding, or maybe they've, they've figured it out like yourself and looked into each other. Yeah. But it, it, it is, the profound difference between us as sexes is, is insane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we pay lip service, you know, and we, but we don't really ever understand it. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating yeah. that. It is fascinating, mate. Can I bring something else? Yeah, yeah, cool, mate, please um, crack on. What I want to say is that, so, so I don't have a big family ask, right? And, and I don't have kids. And um, so I believe that my journey that I went on, all these different experiences, trying these different things was necessary because I had to lean into something now, you don't have to go, a man doesn't, well, a human, but a man doesn't have to go on a journey like that, you know, but I do believe we have to lean into an edge. Now, you can lean into an edge as a dad. You know, the area of growth for you might be as a dad, especially if there's fear there, because there has to be some fear to move through and initiate that and look back and think, oh, actually, I'm not scared of that now. There's a new reality here. But it doesn't, you don't have to fucking go on yoga retreats and, and drink mushrooms, you know what I mean? It can be fatherhood, it can be, business you know as long as there's a fear that we lean into there's growth in that how much are you still a work in progress with this stuff like you, you, 100 you, million trillion percent do you ever feel like you go back to the, the old whitey do you have to or, or, or is that is he long dead now because you recognize the behaviors and, and you're able to change yourself um it's so difficult to quantify what is success and what is growth and what is evolution and have i grown as a man it's so difficult that um but, but I do actually try and quantify my life by feeling into how, I mean, I still go back to the old whitey. I still get angry. Sometimes I get fucking confused and anxious, but the yardstick for me as a man is, it doesn't stick to me anymore. Whereas before I might've been angry for fucking a week, or I might've been anxious for three weeks, or I might've held a grudge for two days. It, it, it's less sticky. And I've heard a lot of people say that as well. I mean, I even traveled to India for, for a number of years, which, which 
going to gurus and stuff like that, you know. And um, I, I went, I went through that scene, and um, I've often heard so-called enlightened people saying, well, the genuine ones, saying, look, I still experience every single emotion on the planet, but it just doesn't stick to me anymore. I'm back in my centre. I'm back in my centre. Have you come across, um, you said the legitimate ones, have you come across some absolute charlatans got halfway through this going, what the fuck am I doing here? I've listened to a lot of so-called gurus, yeah. And, um, yeah. Is it normally like, here's this advice, it's going to cost you this? Not always, no, but um, there's a lot of dogma around. There's, you know, there's a lot of dogmatic beliefs around. Every podcast I've done in the, this series to What a Flanker, dogma and extremes on social media is it's been flagged in every single one. Mm. Somebody says, my way of doing things is the only way and everyone else is wrong. Run fucking Under, miles. Yeah, 100%. With um, with all these systems you've looked at, because I, I want to come on to your sort of mentoring stuff and the stuff you did with Uruguay. I know we've been talking for a while, but it's, it's fascinating. Um, have you identified, cherry-picked, is there a sort of a Craig White system? Because not only have you taken it, you've put it into practice yourself. What would be, say, your, sort of your, your key five elements of what you do are? Can I answer that differently? Of course you can. So the Uruguay experience, what I've learned more than ever, Hask, more than ever, is whenever I show up or whatever intention I bring, whatever energy I bring into a scenario, I'll, come, I'll elaborate in a minute, is what I get. I'll give you an example with Uruguay. So in a nutshell, the work that I did with Uruguay was about love. You won't hear a lot of coaches saying that, mate, it was about love, right? Now, I remember the first time well, I wanted to, I suggested to the coaching staff, I wanted to get the guys in a circle and, and go through a process with them. And every one of the coaches said to me, mate, um, are you sure about this? Uh, mm, um, the boys won't open up. You know what I mean? Now, I had the courage and the confidence to say to them, mate, do you realise that, that those are your own projections? Do you realise that you're projecting your own fears on what I want to do with these players? And then after it, the coaches were like, oh my God, fucking hell. I've never fucking experienced that before. Um, so what I'm getting at is, if I just show up and say, do you know what? I'm gonna fucking risk it for a biscuit here and I'm gonna speak about love. I remember giving the, the Uruguay team a talk, I don't know, a year before the World Cup on the two sides of love. The one side of love, which is the soft friendship, kindness, supporting each other, loving each other, touch which is in abundance in Uruguay mate fucking those Latin cultures and the other side of love which I, I told them was missing at the time the other side of love which is it's, it, which is from that place looking at your mate in the eye and saying mate do you know what because I love you I'm going to fucking push you to the death if you f fucking fuck up I'm going to be behind your back one of us is going to lose but we're both going to win you know and that the challenge side of love and the hard love and the tough love um and I was shitting myself. I thought, well, you can't talk about love to a group of rugby players. But when I showed up and I, and, I, and I was vulnerable, every one of them was vulnerable. There was laughter, there was tears, there was insights. And, and that was the start of a catalyst. It was, it was incredible. And we did a lot more work like that um, on a deeper and deeper, deeper level as we got into the World Cup. And we had this mantra of shock the world. But behind that was a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of deep work and breaking down the loss against Fiji, which was heavy by 66 points in Romania on a tour, breaking it down into, well, we can't fucking beat Fiji at that, 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 and that, that's impossible, but we can beat them at that, 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 and that, 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 and love came into that, and brotherhood came into that, and presence came into that. So we kind of focused on what we could focus on in order to shock the world. Mate, that, that is fascinating, that the very fact that I knew the reaction before you even said that the coaches would be like, I'm not, I'm not sure. Because that would be my, my, my not my reaction, because I, I am open-minded for those things. But judgment is in everything. Yeah. Um, and I actually think in society now, we, we're, we're split. We, we only ever get one side of the love. We either get, we either get the soft love which, and, and cheerleaders for the soft love. That'd be nice. And, but we, we, lost, we lose the tough, mm. tough love. And yeah. actually, like you're right, you can't have any sort of progress without either one of them. Yeah. Um, and some people think that, you know, I was talking to this, you know, about men opening up and talking. It's opening up and talking, but we're talking with the physical 
tools to develop you in actual there has to be physical action and, and there's both sides of, of it and we seem to, to to lose that because of this 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 dogma what um was that bond with Uruguay the, the most insane bond you'd have with any team yeah it, it was it was uh yeah it, like I said it was it was about love um it, yeah it was incredible do you think it's profoundly changed those players because to, to there's nothing better than talking about something a feeling better and, and self-development, but then putting that to practice and getting a win and then improving them. Do you think that a lot of them will carry this on? I do think a lot of them will carry it on, yeah. Um, and also Haskell, it was never about winning. You know, it was about shocking the world. We didn't know how we were going to shock the world. We just wanted to shock the world. It was never like, you have to win that game. Um, it was about, and this is the way we, I, I sold it all the time. It was about, Okay, it was about being a better rugby player, but it was also about being a better mate, a better son, a better uncle, a better potential father. It, it was it was miles bigger than the rugby, and that's important for me because recently I was I was doing work with a team, and um, mate, it was fucking so much pressure to win at all costs. Fucking players were shitting themselves, and. I mean, come on, win for what? Like you might, your winning, your reasons for winning are different to his reasons for winning, to his, to his, to his, to his, and and we have to tap into that, otherwise it's um, there's too much pressure on players. Because almost like the why, the why, a lot of the time is is irrelevant because you all have different whys, and th and that's what people I think sometimes forget is that we try to. If we don't have a uniform belief system or a uniform why, it makes people unhappy, mm. but it's irrelevant. As long as mm. you're there and doing it, well, your why doesn't matter. It's kind of, the, you know, the, the how and, and you know, that, that, that process. Do you think um, any other national teams are in a position or a premiership team in a position to go through that growth that, you've, that you talk about? Um, yeah, I think it's on the verge. I definitely think it's on the verge. Um, I don't have enough evidence because I don't know a lot about the teams, but um, can I talk about teams here? Can I mention teams? Wait, talk about anything you want. I mean, I mean, I think Quinns are on the verge. Um, I mean, I know Alex Sanderson at, at Sale is, is that type of human being. Yeah, very much so. so yeah. um, and we're seeing more, more of these types all the time. It's, it's exciting. I, I, just, cause I just have that fear that knowing what I know of the rugby world and I see their reaction to stuff and I see... It's still so entrenched, even even from a fan's perspective, you know, because I think the world at large, especially in in the rugby fan world, just aren't ready for that growth. Mm. I mean, they, they, they I, just like those Uruguay coaches. I think if you gave it to them and did, and showed them, yeah. and that being vulnerable and opening up yeah. is is um, is possible, I just I just worry that you know, like I've seen with psychologists, they're around the team, they're there, but f yeah. don't fucking talk to them. Don't, you know what I mean? Mate, the growth is through the staff. Yeah. Mate, players today are fucking open like sponges. Yeah. I mean, that's a generalisation, of course, but a lot of them are really, really open. It's that. It's the staff that, that need the work, in my opinion, to get, to, get to, to be vulnerable and open enough and secure enough and confident enough and loving enough to, to really kind of work with players. After, after the work with Uruguay, did you get hit out by loads of coaches? Did people actually come out of the woodwork or was it still seen as a bit... You know, people because I think sometimes people are intimidated by someone like yourself. Of course, because, because my girlfriend says that all the time. You know, because because to come in and have the conversations we've had, I'm not intimidated by it because I I, I love it and I want to know about it. But for mm. a lot of men, I see. So you know, my, even things like I paint my toenails sometimes, I do whatever, and it makes people so uncomfortable mm. to express themselves because it. it Take their, their construct of what a man should be and how they are, yeah. it completely fucks them and brings them yeah. to question themselves. I would have thought someone like yourself, because of your journey, you're almost a bit of a renegade in those areas and people are intimidated. You, you getting that sense of intimidation? Um, I mean, there's there's two sides to every coin, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, we can only be ourselves as a has, can't we? And um, it's my hope that some men will be inspired and, and of course there's always the opposite there's always yin and yang happening all the time there's always opposing forces there always, there always will be but yeah I do think some people are, um, are, are intimidated yeah do you um, do you feel 
because I wrote this down, do you feel much more, and I'm going to say this, much more of a weapon now? So you had the, you had the strength and conditioning element, you had that drive, that self-development to constantly keep learning, which I think is, and this is what I always find funny, I don't know if just go on a little tangent, people talk about always wanting to get better, <laughs> yet so the biggest area they could get better in is the one area that they don't ever, they don't ever look at. So you were doing everything, but probably left that, that side. Do you see that as a real common trait in men? Like, they make all the right noises, but they just don't work on that, that area. Of course, yeah. Um, I mean, even going back to what you said about people getting uh, threatened by kind of, I guess, my message or your message, um, they'll only get threatened by it if, if wherever they are, they don't feel safe. And, and yeah, it's important to create safe spaces for men. It really is. But do you now feel... With that, do you feel like a more rounded man? Do you feel like you're a more powerful coach than you've ever been? Yeah. Um, there's still a void, which is a positive void that's driving me to be even better and know more about myself and know about more about others and um, learn how to sell my message better for the benefit of others. But yeah, I do, I do feel more rounded. Yeah. So I, mean, I mean, I'm 50 this year. Are you? If I wasn't, I'd Fuck me, I need to drink some Ayanaska and do some yoga, mate. You don't look a day, <laughs> day over 32. What you been, What the hell have you been doing? Well, we know what you've been doing. Um, obviously, uh, you know, I, I want to talk next about kind of the mentoring stuff. So you've set up a mentoring business. Do you want to talk about what it is and what the goals of that are? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I have two strands to what I do. I have an, I created an organisation called Men Without Masks. I'll talk about that in a minute. And, and I have Craig White Mentoring and... Um, if you like, the niche that I want to go into that I've been moving into with Craig White Mentoring is all around the soft, the soft skills, if you like. You know, there's, there's, there's a whole saturation with all the, me the techniques and the systems and, you know, technology. And um, I, I see a real need um, for, if you like, the, the human side of things. So I offer one-on-one -on -one mentorships, but I also offer group mentorships as well. Um, and I also offer private intensives where people come to me um, for one day, two days, three days up north where I live in Hebden Bridge. And we combine nature and cold water swimming with some classroom work. And, um, but within my, um, the, if you like, the journey through my mentorship work, mentorship work starts with number one, self-awareness or self-understanding. So things like, we cover things like um, really and truly understanding our own inner GPS, where that comes from, why it's driving us somewhere where it may be driving us towards, um, joining the dots of our life themes to really cultivate a deeper sense of gratitude and inspiration, um, getting clear on our unique talents and strengths, blind spots and weaknesses, projecting a, a value-driven, talent expression-driven vision, and, and then coming back and assessing what's stopping us, what's holding us back, and then cultivating a roadmap and some actions to to kind of move towards that vision and get unstuck. And the second part is more about others. The first part's about us, which is a key component that loads of people miss out. And the second stuff is all the critical interpersonal skill stuff that I wasn't taught, I was shit at, and I had to relearn and become good at. And that is everything from understanding the phenomena of rapport and why I might want to hug you and my, why I might want to run away from you and owning that instead of blaming that. The phenomenon of rapport, listening skills, the art of questions, the art of giving feedback and building a feedback culture, presentation skills, um, and so on and so on. And, and the last piece is around team building, communicating in teams and the art of building trust. So that's kind of, a, in a nutshell, my, my mentoring work within, if you like, professional sports. So I'm, I'm kind of targeting um, coaches at the moment but I'd also love to get a group of players in the room or a group of ex-players. Uh, I think ex-players well. are fascinating. I mean, I've spoken quite openly about the loss of identity, <laughs> finishing, finishing with a, a broken body, expectations, um, mm. you know, a direction. You know, all the things we were taught as a, as a young sportsman is about, or, or most people have, is the desire for material items, you know, and then getting them and then not realising they have any worth and, yeah. and, and direction and what you do. I, I mean, I think yeah. it would be fascinating yeah. for them. Yeah. But you're right, it's yeah. interesting to target the coaches because if they get on board, Everyone else, yeah. you know, gets on board. 100%. But I'd love to get the players on, on my other stuff that I'm doing. So I, I have an organisation called Men Without Masks. And within Men Without Masks, we run a, like a one-day online immersion. 
and we were on a, a five day retreat. So the five day retreat is, I mean, I've been doing them now for four years. Um, 20 men come together. It's a safe, well, it, it, it's, it's a space where there's no phone, there's no screens, there's no laptop, come away from the noise of life, come away from the distractions of life, sit together as a group of blokes. In day one, we cultivate a deep sense of safety. And then we go on a journey over four days and we, we learn a little bit more about our past, become a little bit more grateful for our past. We cultivate present moment awareness, awareness and we just develop a healthier sense of masculinity and what it means to be a man and project a meaningful, purposeful vision into the future. And, um, and it's rich, it's incredibly rich and it's, it's theater and it's, it, yeah, and it's, um, I'm just so humbled to offer that type of work, but I want to get sportsmen onto that. And I think when they look initially, it's like, whoa, wow, fucking hell, I need to do that, but. So I'm even thinking about creating a retreat called Sportsmen Without Masks. Sign me up. Sign e you up. Ex-Sportsmen Without Masks. I would, I would love to do some of this stuff. I think it's, um, I think it's fascinating. I think people procrastinate and put stuff off when actually now's the time to, to step in. If people want to find out more information about any of those things or sign up, to yeah. where, where do they go yeah. for that? Uh, they can go to menwithoutmasks.com. They can go to craigwrightmentoring.com. You can find Men Without Masks and Craig White Mentoring on Instagram. Check out Craig White on LinkedIn and uh, Men Without Masks and Craig White, White Mentoring also on LinkedIn. Just a question uh, to sort of really finish off is, is what do you feel is the biggest problem facing men at the moment? That's a massive question, and the way I'll answer it, which is just coming up to me now, is is the purpose void, the lack of purpose void. And just to touch on that, because I know we've not got a massive amount of time left, um, you know, in tribal towns we had a purpose. You know, we were the hunter, we were the protector, we had a purpose. I mean, even within the agricultural revolution, there was a purpose. All the wars through humanity, it's, it, you know, they've all been men. There was a purpose, something to die for. Um, we find ourselves in a reality now where there's no real wars anymore. There's no, we don't have to go to war anymore. We can't have kids. Women have moved into some of the roles that we used to have as men. It's like, fuck, where do I go? There's no healthy initiation. It's like, what is a man? What am I supposed to be doing? And how can I make some sense of meaning and, and, have, and, and, and value in this life? So that's why I created the retreat, because it, it fills all those voids. We get safe with each other. We learn from each other. There's healthy initiation. We, fa we find out what's really important and let go of the shit that we think is important, but it's not. And we project a vision that's like meaningful. It's like, wow, okay, now, now there's something to live for. It's not easy for men because we, we can't, for women, having kids is a big purpose. We can't do that. And we're not going to war, so we have to redefine it. Where's left to go for you? Um, life's, life will become more simple. Um, I'm still involved in rugby a little bit and I'll continue to do that because I feel there's, there's something there for me to, to lean into. You know, rugby's given me so much like it has you and it's like, it's like my mum at the moment, I want to give back, she should give, me, give back and it's a bit like rugby. I never knew what that meant, giving back, but I do feel a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm with Fiji leading into the world, next World Cup. We're going to get to the World Cup semi-final. And... Uh, <laughs> we interested to get, on that just note, to, 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 because Ireland culture is, I believe, just from talking about it, talking to Dan Lear, who runs kind of the, the Ireland, um, you know, Pacific Island Players Association, mm. they're such closed ranks. I'll yeah. be fascinated. Yeah. And I'd love to hear, yeah. obviously, with confidentiality, of what, whether you can achieve that openness, because yeah. I just don't... Well, it, do that with well, them. It's, it's difficult because you never see the players, but hopefully there's a window before the World Cup where we can get them together and do something special. Um, so, so there's that. And um, outside of that, I'm just going deeper into my retreats and um, offering more mentorship one-on-ones with people and bigger retreats. And um, life's becoming more simple. Um, we're moving into a house in April that's on top of a hill with an incredible view. We're going to get a cat, two dogs, chickens, and go hiking and call swimming every day. And are you happier than you've ever been? Um, I, li I, I like to use the word contentment. I mean, I get stressed with you know, finances and stuff like that, but, but, but I'm, it's underpinned by 
a feeling of contentment. Because I was talking to my psychologist a, a little while ago and, and, and I didn't pick up on it at the time because you were giving a fantastic answer, but the, the mindfulness, I'm like a sh I always use now, I'm like a shark. If a shark starts swimming, it's dead. That's my approach. And you said, mm. obviously, you've never been still. I'm never still. Yeah. And I, what I've had to, to do is find m mechanisms to still myself because mm. um, I have such a diversity of different things I do in life and it pulls you to a million different places. Actually be able to mm. switch off and be mindful. Yeah. That's why I've started getting a little bit into the breathing. You know, right. some of the time when it's slightly warmer, sitting on the step, having a cigar, just watching the world go past and just relax and mm. sit in it and not be thinking. And, and like people will say about clearing your mind, but you, you can't, but you could, but yeah. you couldn't, you can be on something. I'm, I looked at like nature. I looked at life where I come out my front door sometimes and take the dog for a walk. I've got a dog and I breathe and I think some of the simplest moments are the fact that I'm here, I'm alive, mm. I'm, I'm enjoying this. I've got mm. a dog, nature's beautiful. And it, it sounds really, you know, woke and stuff, but it actually really works yeah, for me. Of I mean, what are we like as humans? I mean, even the concept of mindfulness, we complicate and get stressed about it. <laughs> we, think we, we think we have to meditate. Again, it's about the individual. You could go for a walk with your dog and look at a sunset and that works for you. And, yeah. and another guy can actually sit in a yoga posture like that for an hour and that works for him. Yeah. It's, you know, there's so many, there's so much richness, richness in life that can bring us back to the present moment. You don't have to go on a, a meditation app, but connecting with nature is huge. We've not touched on that, but it's absolutely enormous. You know, we, we, we can explore so many different modalities, but the biggest one for me right now is, is reconnection with nature. But you know, people have bizarrely for the first time because lockdown forced us inside and humans, it seems to me, is if you take away the liberty uh, and tell them they can't do something, even though they never thought about doing it, they want to do it. Yeah. Like people in the first lockdown were like, I, have to, I want to be able to go and climb a mountain. Like, but you've never, you don't even walk down to the shops. Well, I need to, I need to go fucking canoeing. But when you saw people in that first lockdown coming out and get that hour of exercise, mm -hmm. how many people were off their phone going, oh my God, there's the birds, mm. there's the tree, mm. there's the sights, there's smells. I, I, I wonder, I won't last because we, we're humans, we, yeah. you know, we just do one thing and then we move on. But it is fascinating to talk about nature. Yeah, it is. And the importance of that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, a, I, mean, and we're, I mean, we're walking antennas, we're like mobile phones and we need to plug into nature again, you know. It's just, yeah, it's just, it just wins every day for me, it just brings me back to my center. Whitey, mate, I've enjoyed this so much. Thank you so much. I think it's fascinating. And, I, and, and personally, like I said, I'd, I'd love to explore some more stuff with you. Um, maybe I'll come on one of the, the retreats and do something and maybe come back and we'll do another podcast about what we experienced because um, you know, the whole idea of what a flank of the podcast is to interview people I'm fascinated by. You, you had a huge impact on my life, you had a huge back impact on rugby. It's fascinating to hear about your journey. Thank you so much for coming on. No, thank you, mate, and thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. It's good to connect with you again. Anytime. Well, no, eight years. Let's yeah. not leave it that long next time. Um, again, menwithoutmask.com, craigwhite.com for any of the information. If you want to join the mentoring, I've been James Haskell. This has been Craig White. You've been listening to What Flanker, the podcast series two. Don't forget to pick up a copy of my book in paperback. Please subscribe. Please share. Remember, this is a YouTube show as well. And you can pick the podcast up on all your usual content providers. Mm -hmm.